Hi, nice to see you all. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for listening to me. Today, I'm going to try and shine a little bit of a light on the topic of design for societal challenges. My name is Karen van Hutterveld. I'm a graphic designer from the Netherlands. And I'm one of the founding members of Foundation We Are. I will start with introducing a little bit the work of the Foundation. After which I will go into depth about uh, our views upon societal challenges and the roles design and designer uh, can and maybe should take in the, when addressing these. So, Foundation We Are. To describe it in one sentence, we say we do collaborative design for societal impact. Basically, what this means is that we are a group of uh, various uh, creatives with different expertises, different backgrounds. For instance, a graphic designer, we have an illustrator, we have an architect, we have a social designer, somebody who's an expert in experience or game design. You name it, we, ha <laughs> we have a, a lot of different expertises in-house. In and one of our core values is um, we mean uh, we join the strength together to uh, set about change. And um, our core values uh, or the beliefs of the foundation is that designers should work together with experts, various interdisciplinary topics and uh, collaborations. For instance, like we did with our first project, but I'm going to tell you later about when we work together with human rights defenders. So, um, we support designers, uh, or no, we promote and implement design by... We promote and we implement design methodologies uh, across various fields, and we envision a future in which designers, together with scientific experts, politicians, policy makers and societal actors collaborate uh, to solve the problems of their time. Because we believe that society benefits uh, from a creative approach. Um, this means that what we do, our activities include supporting designers by creating uh, spaces where they can work and develop themselves. We initiate design projects. Uh, we support and facilitate uh, collaborations with experts but we also research and disseminate knowledge via a variety of projects and tra trajectories, um, which I will expand on later what that actually contains, uh, with some practical examples. So, to come to the, uh, the question, what contribution can design make to solve societal challenges? But what are societal or social challenges actually? Because I don't know anybody here in the room has an idea, but it's quite a big uh, concept. Uh, maybe you think about the challenge of climate change as a societal issue. Maybe something about poverty or uh, even difficulty to access certain municipality services uh, can be a societal challenge. Um, for instance, I think about uh, SDGs, I think there's like 17 different goals de defined that uh, every society face. So, of course, these are very extensive and maybe even too big to just be solved by designers alone. Uh, within the foundation, we have uh, defined five frames or scopes wh wherein we work. Uh, these are um, cultures of information, systems of governance, civic society, ethics of technology, and justice in the Anthropocene. Uh, cultures of information uh, was defined in response to the societal and instrumental need to rethink our relationships and behaviors towards communication. Uh, be it online or, or offline, information has become um, a common for a society and uh, in such it needs to be nurtured. We aim to question traditional settings of information uh, within this scope. Then uh, the systems of in systems of government, we try to create a space uh, in which design can address the complexities and contradictions that governmental institutions are facing. 
Whilst in civic society we involve people within larger invisible uh, systems in everyday life. We engage uh, with drivers of social change like NGOs or local citizens that work on global issues. And we aim to create within that scope new solutions and strategies uh, for the challenges they face in their practice. With eth ethics of technology, uh, we look towards human interaction with anything to do with technology, and we use it as a space for reflection upon ethical implications of technology. And the last, Justice in the Anthropocene, there we investigate and question configurations and protocols of justice and how the rights of people are influenced by the current way of how we use our environment. So, still very broad topics um, where a lot of challenges uh, arise and can be defined. However, societal challenges in its core always refers to a problem that arises when people interact with each other or with a bigger group or a system of society. There's always a, a human factor. This means that uh, in the case of designing for societal impact, uh, the practice of design changes focus from the, like the object human-based uh, or centric uh, focus towards a situation, uh, social, society-centered focus. Moreover, people involved are, the people who are involved with projects like these are emancipating within the design process, becoming or getting actually quite a vital role when we talk about things like co-design and co-creating. Uh, this also means that the role of the designers is shifting towards um, more facilitating and coordinating these kinds of processes. But I'll go uh, into more depth uh, later. Because first, um, I'll tell you a little bit what actually we do. So we design incubators, we design experiences, we design trainings, um, and we design workshops. With the incubators, that's what we call the collaborations that we have with experts outside the field of design. Have designers and experts working one-on-one -on -one in these uh, incubators. And we try to see what form of collaboration works best with uh, between these people. When we design experiences that's mostly based uh, or communication based, or they have a communicative function where we want to engage people with uh, new concepts and new ideas. We design experiences like exhibitions or interventions that use often storytelling as a method to build empathy with a larger group of people and within the audience. And then the trainings and the workshops are to share knowledge and train creative skills and also stimulate working together, co-create and co-design in order to generate new ideas and give actors uh, within a challenge also the tools to creatively address challenges they face in their lives or in their fields. So that's... <laughs> The foundation in a nutshell, uh, the, I will go into the projects we do now to try and, um, well, give a, hopefully some examples of how we actually, or what we actually, or how we actually try to address societal issues. So I'll start actually with the pilot project that I mentioned earlier. This is the We Are Human Rights pro uh, project where we mixed, uh, matched seven designers with seven human rights defenders. In The Hague you have an organization that invites human rights defenders to come and have a rest for a while in the Netherlands and or get edu uh, schooling or whatever other trainings that they, are, that they need. And uh, seven of them are enthusiastic enough to <laughs> join up with a designer and see what could happen to, when collaborating. So this gave us the possibility to work on not very, but quite clearly defined issues and respond to it in a creative way. And 
also whilst doing that, that uh, collaboration, we could research what actually happens when uh, designers collaborate with human rights defenders. So later I'll show you the outcomes of this project, but first I'll go a bit into the collaboration, because for us collaboration is everything. So what we noticed quite quickly is that how a designer and a human rights defenders, the relationship, how their relationship was differed a little bit, where some project or some designers became a partner with the human rights defender working together on, a, on an idea or a concept. Others used the human rights defender as a consultant to get to know more about the context that they worked in or the culture or uh, certain issues. But also we had human rights defenders that were very specific in their needs and, and, and were more a client with a, question, a clearly defined question for the designers. So that's kind of the relationship. If we look at the focus of the projects, we see that that also differs, where uh, designers can have a, a, a certain topic uh, or work together with this human rights defender and look into either the person of the human rights defender um, and the work that they do, or really look at the context that they act in, so a society or something that causes them uh, to have a problem or to really look at the problem. What is, re uh, where, uh, what is the issue you're trying to fight or to defend, the right you're trying to defend and how can design uh, add to that? Then, the outcomes of which also uh, were, or the, the goals of the, the, the designs differed, where of course, nobody said like, okay, you have a problem, ta-da, here's the, here's the solution. The project that we did either implemented something that supported the human rights defender, but it also could support it by means of communication or really just reframing the problem and via kind of a reframement of, a, of an issue, address a whole different kind of angle of this uh, or change the angle of the problem which also came ended up with interesting solutions or concepts if we look at the overview so we have seven uh, projects and seven various relationships uh, various uh, focus points various uh, various goals of the project yeah we summarize this all in a publication where we uh, looked upon what it means to uh, to design for human rights so these are the seven concepts that came out of it. I won't go into too much depth of it, but to summarize, or to summarize it was we had a project that uh, addressed international propaganda and media. We had a project that tried to address uh, intercultural misunderstanding uh, and Another that, for instance, uh, offered a game. Oh, wait. <laughs> Here we have the answers, actually. A game that uh, broadened possibilities for children that didn't have a, a, a lot of role models around them. But we also had a, a concept for a toolbox uh, that helped um, with collecting uh, evidence in uh, illegal deforestation cases or uh, a way to visualize uh, enforced disappearances in Mexico and instead of focusing on the disappeared person, a movie that showed what it actually means when somebody disappeared. What does it mean for a society if somebody is gone? So it's kind of a the negative representation of a person. After we've done did this project, the collaboration type was quite successful. And that's why we are setting up more collaborations like this, where at the moment we are um, having an incubator running that sees designers mix, uh, matching with journalists, where we have a designer duo uh, that work together with the archive of uh, Nicaraguan newspaper, and they are creating 
And I can't show you anything yet because we hope it gets finalized in the summer. But they are creating an interactive article using the archive of this newspaper to show all the actors involved uh, within the revolution and also show all the different points of, points of views uh, of this of all these actors within this uh, issue. One of the main things that all these incubators always have, or what we find important, is that designers are always included during the entire process. So not that the designers are, are brought by in the end, like, oh, put this in a nice layout or um, make an app or do something, but th that they're re really involved in also the content of what is being created. So find new forms for that. Uh, and we hope to do more of those. The other thing that I want to tell you about are the experiences that we design, uh, mainly the uh, experiences that we, where we use audio. I told you about the Human Rights Project. One of the other things that we did with it, except from the projects and the publication, the research around it, is that we also wanted to exhibit them to a larger audience, not only um, the projects itself, but also, of course, the work that human rights defenders do. But we wanted to exhibit it to um, the audience that are visiting the Dutch Design Week. I don't know whether anybody of you have ever been to Eindhoven during Dutch Design Week, but it's a massive event where over 100,000 people come and visit the city and want to see everything, and that's a lot. <laughs> uh, which means that how do you say it? Uh, attention spans are very low, or the people want to see everything very quickly, make pretty pictures for Instagram, and then leave again. But we didn't want that. We wanted to grasp their attention. We wanted them to have a moment and really listen or see and really um, experience the work that was done. So what we did is uh, we made this audio exhibition. People were bustling about visiting all the exhibitions and we said, stop. Do you have 15 minutes? Do you want to fill in this uh, questionnaire and put on these headphones? You can't skip anything or go back. You just have to go through it and that's it. So here you see some images of that. Uh, we made them enter a rather dark room <laughs> with the projects presented there. And they uh, were guided through it, through this uh, piece of audio. And I will let you listen to it now. Hide and rule. Okay, sorry. Article two. Everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration without distinction of any kind, such as race, color, sex, language, religion, or other status. Lucandrea Baraldi works together with Madiha, a journalist and human rights defender from Sudan, who promotes freedom of expression and equality. Sudan has a multitude of communities and tribes. However, only one of them is in control of the political power and the media. For this reason, the rest is left in poverty and isolation. But although these communities share the same struggles, they are unable to work together because cultural differences get in the way. In order to start a conversation between them, we need a space for connection where all the communities are equally valued and represented. Look at the illustration on the table. To achieve this connection, Luc Andrea proposes a mobile exhibition which travels through the streets of the communities and stages the diverse cultural identities of Sudan. The model in front of you is made to test out ways of exhibiting. You can try it for yourself. To achieve mutual understanding, I believe it's important to reveal similarities and differences on a human level, uh, starting with everyday things like slippers and tableware or food. But then the question is, how do you represent everyone equally? So we had this whole audio thing, I'll let you listen to another one next uh, up. We really thought about how to uh, simplify, simplify or make this uh, large pile of research and material and concepts into a very, uh, well, this 15-minute experience for people in a way that they wanted to, or kept engaged, uh, but also that kind of 
made them emphasize with, with the stories and the products and the, uh, and the, cha or the, the concepts. So we really thought about, okay, how to mix this audio. We used the audio of Eleanor Roosevelt, who actually is uh, that's, uh, publicly available, where she re reads out the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, together with uh, the designers and a narrator that told everybody, like, okay, go now to the next step, do this, go there, uh, pick up this, which kind of took over the, the person's uh, experience of, of just... Uh, running around and looking, we really made them um, sit down and uh, or sit down, uh, focus for a bit. So that these kind of uh, resulted in uh, pictures like this, people uh, looking and listening and not talking. And fun fact, we once had a, uh, during the exhibition, we had somebody who was um, blind in there, so they even couldn't see anything, but they were... The, the, somebody was supporting them or helping them along and like say like oh feel this material or feel, feel that material while they were listening it was really nice to see then i have another one that i'll let you listen to article 20 well everyone has the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and association down works together with francis a grassroots activist from kenya who fights for social justice on the wall, you see visuals of Down's experience of working with Francis. A few years ago, he got kidnapped by the police because of his work and was about to be executed secretly. But he was well known in the activist community, so his disappearance started a digital movement on Twitter. Because of this attention, the police were scared of the consequences of killing him. So after two days, they released him. So actually, his life was saved by the hashtag FindSakwa. This story showed me a different way to support human rights defenders. Grassroots activists are extremely vulnerable, and they lack a proper support system because they are not part of any organization and have no economic stability. I kept a journal which I called How I Became an Ally from Not Giving a Shit. And this shows how Frances' story raised my empathy. At the beginning of the exhibition, you filled out a test and you received a score. With this paper, you can translate that score into a level of empathy. There is a stack of paper in front of you. Please pick one up. The goal of the project is to create long-distance allies internationally. Dan proposes a web platform that can be reached by potential allies here, she suggests alternative ways of supporting grassroots activists according to people's levels of empathy. Uh, yeah, so uh, you heard two of the example stories. We had seven of them in total. Uh, the questionnaire that the one was referring to, I'll show you as well, was quite nice because visitors didn't know what to expect with this and uh, we gave out random numbers. And it was funny to see how um, people immediately ascribed some kind of value to a number, like one is high and 27 was really low, but there weren't any kind of value or there wasn't something that was better than the other. It was just a nice way uh, to start this conversation about empathy building. So after this, actually, we created another uh, audio experience for the Nor Norwegian Human Rights Fund in collaboration with Memria. Who, Memria is an, a platform online that collects audio from human rights defenders where they tell about the, uh, the, what, the work that they do and what, they, uh, what challenges they face. And we were asked to uh, see how, what kind of installation we can build that would share these stories in a way that people were actually engaged with it, uh, more than just going online and listening to it. So this actually sounds quite familiar, uh, that, or similar than uh, with the first exhibition. But what we did was also uh, use audio, also with Eleanor Roosevelt uh, and the voices um, of uh, the human rights defenders mixed in with it, and a narrator that when uh, would put you through the exhibition uh, but there's a bit difference uh, with these two exhibitions and that's that 
in the first one where we really wanted to explain the possibilities of well, social design or designing for a social uh, challenge. And here uh, the focus was really on um, the, humor, the stories. So the stories here were the, the, the main uh, the topic of uh, the exhibition. So the stories, what we did here was that um, every story that we picked, we made, made a hat for, because there's a saying in Colombia, apparently, to wear somebody's hat or to look through somebody uh, somebody's uh, hat. Uh, it's similar as to stand in somebody's uh, shoes, so to experience somebody else's life. And this is something that we really like because we think it's very important to learn about each other's lives and to be able to empathize with, it, uh, with people. So we literally made these hats. Um, so this is one for, uh, that represents freedom of education, freedom uh, of uh, different views or having your own opinions. People could go through the exhibition and sit down on these chairs and only then the audio would play. So there was also one that had as a topic freedom of a movement and if you wanted to listen to it you had to stand in these halls and you couldn't move. So this person was deprived of her right to uh, move about. And in order to listen to it, you could also, you could only stand at, at a certain moment, in a certain way. And then we had, the other one is a hat for, that explains about discrimina the discrimination a uh, human rights defender experienced when working uh, because of the way that she looks. And this is one that is about inequality, where the one in the higher chair can listen to the story pretty well, and the lower one will barely hear it, but both of you are needed to play the audio. Yeah, I have here also some audio, but I don't think that Spanish will be, <laughs> but similar, Eleanor Roosevelt and the, and the narrator. So yeah, those are two big exhibitions that we did. Uh, other experiences that we built, I'll go through it uh, a bit quicker. Like I said before, uh, what we do when we build an experience, we want people to not only understand, to tell people how they feel or uh, what the issue is, but it's important to actually try and make them feel it or um, that they really experience this. So this is an installation to collect uh, data about how to train artificial intelligence. So instead of just uh, filling in the questionnaire, we said, go into the, into the AI machine and actually teach them. Then uh, I'll, I'll go through a couple of projects now. Then uh, we have another outreach project where we made uh, visitors of the Dutch Design Week again, uh, other year though, help us reach out there to all the members of the European Parliament by sending then 750 letters. Uh, what we asked for our uh, visitors or the audience is buy a stamp and put it in, a, in the mailbox and send a letter to your uh, representative in Brussels. Uh, and the letter contained actually kind of what I'm doing here, a plea to uh, include creatives in, uh, um, yeah, in societal issues and challenges. So that's quite nice. Yeah, so outreach to the members of the European Parliament. This is a thing that we made, or an avatar that we made during COVID crisis. At some point there were some events going on and some, some were only, or at least in the Netherlands, you could join, but only digitally or half physically. It was a kind of a hassle. And what we did, we were organizing uh, together with Stroom in The, ha in the Hague, uh, an event, a two-day event with a lot of talks and lectures but only 30 people could attend. And we thought, okay, how can we make the people who are watching a stream, like maybe now, more involved with, this, with these talks? So we made a doll or an avatar, we call it, 
where somebody was in the, in the Zoom room and uh, we put it in an iPad into this doll and a member of the audience had to take care of it. So there were quite interested conversations uh, when people were talking like, oh, I have, an, I have a question or can you move me a little bit or I can see. It was a very intimate way of uh, joining up with uh, an event like this. And then on the, on the left you also see a lamp that we made where one of the speakers who, were, who was actually uh, in America could, from, a dis from where she sat, turn on the lamp uh, to interfere or have a question when somebody was speaking. Uh, that was also quite funny. So yeah, it's tools to connect digitally, the digital digitally present more intimately to a seminar. The other thing that, I, uh, that we do is the, the skill training and workshops we design. This is a workshop uh, called Reconstructing the Classroom, where made a kind of a role-playing activity to teach um, educators uh, about design thinking methods, or at least creative methods, in order for them to think about uh, situations that they might encounter in the classroom and see how they can respond to it outside of the, the set ideas that they might ha have or structures that they have usually, uh, usually use in schools. So by having them, how do you say that? We make them uh, impersonate or have, take a up a role in the classroom, in this game at least, that they don't usually have. So at some point, or and, and then act that out. So uh, we have, for instance, students, and we also gave them characteristics. So a student that is nervous will act differently than um, a teacher that is angry or something. And how do you act and how can you reconstruct your classroom to facilitate these needs or these uh, emotions in order to, to provide to these wishes. And another version, or after we did this, we reiterated for another workshop or another training where we kind of did the same thing with the role playing and the tasks and everything. But this was focused on uh, the issue of uh, chronic absenteeism in classrooms, so that when people really stop, or pupils really stop turning up. So that's also about uh, rethinking uh, uh, and reworking uh, common practices. Then uh, the last thing that we do is that with the workshops. Uh, the workshops are really about co-creating and gathering gathering and sharing knowledge. So when you have uh, a certain uh, societal issue, then it's always good to have the actors that are involved with this issue sit around the table and discuss and go through the motions that they usually go through and, and map that. And as designers, we try to then make that visible. And also, because uh, that helps with defining where the issues might, or where interventions might happen. So th this is an example of uh, the workshops that we do, with a toolbox, and librarians in this case, who have a lot of data and possibilities to their, uh, how do you say that, uh, around that they can use to inform people, but they don't, know how to get to the right data and the right time. So we're trying to map that here. So yeah, those are a lot of the things that we've been doing. I want to highlight the last thing, and that is actually what I, I've been trying is that, or to explain is that the function or the role of the designer uh, has been moving towards this to focus more on this societal or this uh, context-based design, which means that um, well, design is moving towards the social field, and uh, this means this means when the agency of design engages itself with this societal, uh, these societal challenges, the individual designer doesn't suffice. So the in individual star designer that makes something and say here a solution, go go about it. 
So uh, a societal challenge needs to be addressed by, like it says, a society itself. All the actors that are involved are the ones that are subject of the design and it will influence them and that's why we need to include them in design processes. And like I mentioned before, this means that they become co-creators and co-designers actually. And for designers, this means that we need to start wearing different hats. So that of the experts, that of the manager, the coordinator or catalyst of creativity and innovation. Designers like us, we need to position ourselves um, as intermediary, intermediaries uh, within the stakeholders to translate ideas and wishes of the actors in a problem. So we need to encourage people to participate uh, in sessions like I showed earlier. And we have to find spaces to collectively work together, generate ideas, connect to policy and policy makers and uh, stimulate the social entrepreneurship. As a designer or a social designer, uh, like we call it in the Netherlands at least, it means that we, are, we need to maintain uh, relationships, we need to be flexible, uh, we need to be flexible in different contexts and value other people's inputs and knowledge. Uh, so by combining these functions and possibilities of design and designers, we believe that we can establish impact, hopefully. And therefore, what we do, at least in, in Eindhoven, is we have literally created a space, a maker space in our headquarters, where we can facilitate these activities, like co-designing workshops, uh, lectures, uh, whatever, anything like that to really make it a place where people can come together and learn from each other and, and share thoughts and all that kinds of things. And to conclude, or well, other pictures, to conclude, I want to say last, a last thing, societal impact can only be achieved with time and with energy and putting your energy to creating a community uh, that understands understands challenges and are willing to work together on these challenges. So, in short, collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. Um, yeah, I'm a bit short on but whatever. Thank you for listening. To learn more about all our projects and to go into depth to that, you can visit our website at foundationweare.org or connect over LinkedIn. I hope it works, the QR code. Thank you. Karen van Lutenreveld. Karen van Lutenreveld, yeah, that's it. Thank yes. you.